Thank you for joining this talk. And I would like to thank to um, Anselm Franke and Hyunjin Kim and also David Tang for realizing this very important show, I believe, and also this wonderful uh, event. Uh, okay, I, you know, I don't have to introduce myself because uh, Hanwangu, Miss Hanwangu, has to show my face so big. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this time I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, a few concepts around um, tradition and uh, uh, Orientalism and uh, I would call colonial unheimlich. Uh, okay. So what I want to start from the one uh, start from the uh, uh, the Korean art movement in. Uh, 1980s. So in the 80s, what we call Minjok art it can be translated literally as national, national art and uh, Minjung art, people art or people's art, was used to describe artistic practice based on anti-dictatorship, anti-colonial and resistant nationalism. So when when we currently consider these terms, they sound like really dead words. Uh, the, especially the Min Jok and Min Jung, like the language, uh, the words favored, favored in, in maybe in North Korea. North Korea always say the nation first, the Korea first and the, the nation first. And uh, so these words are really uh, not really cool, uh, especially for the young people. And what you can see uh, here is the banner painting based on wood block print uh, by Choi Byung Soo, the artist, uh, one of the representative example of Minjok art or Minjung art. Uh, at the time, people thought that uh, the wood block print as a medium might constitute the Minjok art or entail a Korean traditional form of it. Uh, but this Minjok art or Minjok itself, these days, uh, the popularity of the world has uh, drastically declined over the period of the last 10 or 20 years. There may be Many different reasons, but um, yeah, it's too um, difficult to analyze it. But probably the biggest power would be the globalization, the globalization of Korea in the uh, last 20 years. So there are a couple of other different examples include Oyun's work in the form of traditional Buddhist paintings kind of sat satirizing capitalism. Uh, so you can see these kinds of paintings in the uh, Korean temples uh, everywhere. It's the image of hell. And uh, he kind of, uh, kind of criticizes capitalism, consumerist, consumerist capitalism uh, by using this image of hell of, in a Buddhist imagination. Okay, and uh, it wasn't just Minjok art. You know, probably there's some, there are some other examples like Oyun's other painting. Uh, so in there, there's some uh, kind of kind of adaptation of the uh, Minhua, is a folk art form, and this color and uh, the way he depicts uh, figures, and also he intentionally made like a really kind of scroll painting uh, resembles the uh, kind of Sansu uh, land Chinese landscape painting. But, uh, but at the same time, if you uh, dig in, kind of dig into these forms he, he did in this painting, he applied a lot, uh, not only from these K K Korean old paintings, or you know Buddhist paintings, but you know he had you know 
a lot of influence from like Picasso and, and Posada from Mexico. So uh, again, it's not really purely Korean thing. Okay, other example by Choi min -ha. And uh, in this painting, he, uh, I interviewed him and he said uh, he really wanted to, to invent a new form, contemporary form of folk art tradition in Korea. So he uh, really intentionally made all this you know, weird uh, tree, palm tree, and uh, this color with the mountain and, and sky. And artists of Tansekwa, uh, or, or in English it's monochrome painting. And another important part of the Korean modern art, uh, often suggested, suggested traditional ceramics or Eastern uh, traditional landscape paintings as their core inspirations. This means Traditional philosophy and culture served as key discursive platform, both for calm formalistic paintings and anti-colonial resistant art practices, like Minjok or Minjung art. Uh, so I, this is, okay, sorry. So this is Yu Han's painting. He's a Korean uh, painter, stayed a long time in Japan, and he was the leading figure of this monochrome painting. And it made really a huge market these days, and uh, kind of representative uh, kind of art practice uh, in Japan and, and Korea. Uh, it's become like a million dollars paintings. <laughs> anyway, uh, I would like to say that tradition as discourse once constituted a, a core podium and critical issue, and this is not uh, really uh, accidental. These issues, Minjok form, Eastern aesthetics, anti-colonialism, applying tradition in art, art practice, and so on, which are not as simple as various entanglings of the symbolic institution or the politics of identity, are more complicated and entrenched than in, uh, they appear. In a state of cultural colonization, artists would think that they needed to make use of tradition, naturally almost. However, however the question is, which indications of Asian or Oriental tradition can be used to distinguish Korea or Asia or East from the West? I personally agree that it seems appropriate to see in general that, uh, am I reading okay? Okay. Um, that no realistic criteria can create these divisions. Even if this is true, it does not mean that qualities of tradition, nation, the East, or Asia are not significant or useful as practical paradigm. I mean, it's, it's, it's useful. I'm, I'm, I'm meaning it's not, uh, not uh, it is useful, okay? Kim Su Young's poem is, Kim Su Young, a poem, uh, his poem is the best example to declare this these thoughts. The poem, the poet and the critic, also he was the really uh, horribly good writer also, essayist, and Kim Seung once wrote that, this is famous phrase, traditions, no matter how filthy, are good. This can be a kind of strategic lie or, a, or poetic exclamation, kind of uh, exaggeration. It may catch us red-handed like a ghost. Uh, this famous phrase, actually it, uh, this phrase appeared uh, in a uh, high school textbook. And uh, everyone said it's like a really nationalistic uh, poem. But what I'm, what I'm claiming here is not uh, 
it's, it's, it, this poem is not nationalistic at all. Um, and this famous phrase uh, below, you see, is excerpts from his poem, Colossal Roots, written in uh, 1964. So can you? Yeah, you can read. Um, I made mark on the uh, kind of uh, important part of the, uh, the lines. So it starts with the first line, I still do not know how to sit properly. And this is really funny, isn't it? Because, uh, I mean, this, his, his style, that he, uh, his poem is like a really kind of uh, dry and uh, it's like a, like a little memo. Uh, and he's famous with this uh, kind of non-style style. And um, also the famous for difficulty, this difficult to understand. Okay, uh, and this first line is kind of indication of uh, this uneasiness to have kind of proper lifestyle and uh, and don't know how to sit. And uh, a, f a few friends of hi him knew how to sit, and one uh, sit in in Japanese way. And the other one sit as a labor, working class way, and but he doesn't know how to sit. Uh, so, and then uh, in the second paragraph, uh, reading a book about Korean, a book about Korea written by Isabella Bird Bishop, uh, who was a, a, a visitor to Korea, and he repeats that, repeats what she described. At that the Korea is very odd country with such a remarkable custom. So there is plenty of inaccurate inf information in her book. However, here it says Kim Su Young is in a relationship with Bird Bishop. Uh, even if Bird Bishop had a, pro uh, a pro profound affection to Korea, she was a prominent Orientalist kind of first generation uh, orientalist with a quite imperialist uh, perspective. But looking at Korea through both, uh, both Bishop's eyes, Kim uh, was able to fall in love with it. So this is the second uh, phrase. And he openly is so bold to say that uh, I am in love with Isabel Bird Bishop. And actually she, he introduced uh, in the poem, that she was the first head of the royal, blah 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 blah, and and the, he actually read this book in English uh, because it, it was not translated. So there's some um, another kind of detour of this uh, kind of language game, um, and then uh, he uh, kind of. Uh, quoted what uh, the book said. And then finally he concluded the tradition no matter how filthy are good. And he's, he continued with this sentence, since encountering Mrs. Bishop, it is not so hard for me to put up with Korea. Uh, rotten country, uh, though it is, rather I am awed by it. History, no matter how filthy, is good. I, I will skip a little. I am in, in love with Mrs. Mrs. Bishop, the progressives and socialists are son of bitches. Unification, uh, it means unification of, of two Korea, South and uh, North, and uh, neutrality <coughs> are all pure shit. So he shows his kind of, kind of, uh, um, uh, he anger his anger to the all this ideology and politics. Okay. Uh, okay. But then he uh, moved to what he likes. He likes chamber pot, chamber pots, 
headbands, long pipes, nursery stores, and so on, and ignorant folk. And all reactions are good. Uh, okay, and I will return to the, the uh, poem later on. And then the last sentence is really weird. All these little kind of traditional things, uh, uh, this is translation of the old uh, objects that exist in Joseon Dynasty. So when I read it uh, in Korean, uh, the original text, uh, all these uh, words are not really familiar to me. I can exactly know uh, merely half of it. So yeah, it's English, okay? <coughs> and all these objects come together and make a kind of a hor horrible image. Uh, he uh, said it's kind of mam mammoths in, uh, in horror movies and crows and, and big magpies. And this is really strange. I found this is colonial <laughs> unheimli. Uh, and he might saw the film like a King Kong in black and white film. And uh, I think it's probably, uh, could be, I think, possible to, he, yeah, for him to see this film. And, uh, and this old uh, dead objects from Joseon Dynasty became like uh, King Kong. So even if, uh, okay, uh, so the kind of nonsense here is that Kim Shi Young uh, looks into himself with the bird wish of size and falls in love with uh, what he sees. His orientalist consideration of his own memories, his poem's foundation and its structure metaphorically imply a certain ambiguity such as the definition of orientalism, the difficulties of criticism, and so on. Uh, we can consider Shin Hak Cho's painting as a uh, co um, kind of correspondence to Kim's poem. This is a painting by Shin Hak Cho in uh, 1973. It's one of the, the other representative artists of the Min Jung art, entitled Night Walking. An old man with a card, uh, card is the traditional hat, on his head uh, walks uh, limply on a hollow of an empty, empty road. There's somehow a painful or kind of odd atmosphere on this painting. And it stretches the sense of, sense of tragic on tradition as unreturnable place to anyone who only has a memory about it. And uh, this is another painting by Min Jung Gi and uh, they are good friends. <laughs> I think they share a lot uh, in the, the manner of this painting, uh, how they see the tradition and tra traditional icons. Okay. What, I, what I think about uh, these paintings is that many critics of Orientalism and tradition, like, you know, like a uh, side, but more, more Eric Hobsbawm, see a tradition as a subject or place for the fabrication of certain ideologies. Um, of course, a modern state uh, could take advantage of the authority of traditions through inventing tradition, uh, as the uh, Anselm and uh, Hyun Jin talked about in the uh, previous uh, talk. Uh, whether or not modernity or the modern state use or do not use the authority of tradition through the in invention of tradition. Its continuity is means of utilizing the past for the present. Um, Korean modern politics is generated when the ideological usage of tradition and the fabrication of collective memory are integrated with the claims of the uh, common truths 
of the past, present, or future. And the causation of, the, of using the, the efficacy, the effect of the past to alienate, alienate the wrong elements of the past. Uh, this becomes even more complicated as the two do need to be differentiated. Uh, besides, when one attempts to use tradition to make sense of the present ruptures with the efficacy of the past, or to make it moment to look into the pre present in a bigger time frame, we also become concerned with falling into the trap of the manipulation of ideology and the claim of truth. This could be another form of Orientalism. This is concern as it may occur in, in many times in reality. Okay, uh, I will elaborate more on this. Uh, we can ask if the revival, revival of tradition employed for nation state undertakings which Western intellectuals like Said, Hobsbawm, and so on, criticize, can be applied to Asian countries with different histories as targets of criticism. If so, one can still question whether the methodologies of the West are valid. For, for instance, in Korea, institutions like national museums, you know, national uh, treasure museum, national, uh, you know, the, the ethnographic museum and so on, or state-designated des cultural pro properties and institu institutions are constructed for the benefit of the nation state. That's true. But as institutions for the formulation of the nation state, they remain ideological. Despite this, however, some of, the, some of those who have participated in such projects desperately say that tradition could have disappeared if we didn't even have the, these apparatuses, uh, the government policy and uh, you know, the cultural department and uh, heritage trustees and so on. It might have all uh, evaporated. When Poetkin wrote, uh, tradition is good, no matter how fierce it is, it comes from this urgency uh, uh, and uh, desperation, something very worthy to take a lot of serious risks, risks, risks that can be um, ideologically dangerous, politically incorrect, or aesthetically uh, anachronistic. I am questioning whether critics of Orientalism can be solely justified in this context. Maybe it is uh, very naive to say it, but uh, we are often too, too much of afraid of Orientalism. So I'm saying uh, many times to my students and uh, in the lectures, don't be afraid of Orientalism. Okay. Myself, who is now living in the colonized cultural era, disapprove of Orientalism by choosing the safer or intellectually persuasive side while hiding behind criticism on Orientalism. So this might mean a mere return to another myth called modernity, which is kind of hi hiding behind the, uh, the criticism of Orientalism, not thinking about how we go further. Don't we have, have a tendency to, to regress toward what is evident and where there is no room for further criticism? Um, even the wild images of the, the rebels influenced by Western leftist Orientalism may exist. I mean, uh, in, in CNN, it's clear that they like to see the, all these uh, brutal battles and you know, massacre and, and, and political chaos. It's another uh, Orientalism. 
Uh, in other words, we ought to look into questions of what theoretical and practical motivations are left after the criticism of Orientalism, or what, of what types of post-Orientalism post can be encouraged and shaped. That is, I think, is a really real question. Um, so it's, uh, the text is quite long. Uh, okay, I try fast. Um, we can detect countless examples of Orientalism and criticize them. This is the simplest level. We can also endlessly condemn the politics of looking up uh, toward the West. We can keep analyzing the cause of this in inferiority and demythologize it with kind of, you know, this Roland Barthes idea of mis mis demystifying myth. However, is it enough? The problematic reason uh, why tradition is trapped within Orientalism is that tradition integrates with the fatigue of modernity and with the disappointment to Western culture as much as it relies on myths of imperialism. So maybe you can think about very typical Orientalism. Uh, like, you know, it's not purely Orientalism, but uh, it has been used as very uh, ori Orientalistic uh, imagination, like Zen Buddhism, meditation, all these things. Um, what I'm saying is, what I'm trying to say is the, uh, the fact that the general frustration of Western modern civilization elevates these expectations onto the, uh, of the Zen uh, Buddhism, for example, meditation and other practices cannot be solely identif identified uh, as Orientalism. This certainly has the uh, generated typical Orientalist images, but typical Orientalism itself also has its uh, certain sincerities. Thus, Orientalism is hard to separate from, from demystification and ideological criticism. Rather, what is required is a rupture as at aesthetic and even ontological levels involved in the reproduction of uh, Orientalism. But the entity of Orientalism cannot be shaken unless it goes through the full process of internalizing and incarnating Orientalism overturning its values and ceaseless competition between different cate categories. Uh, so then what aesthetic methodology or characteristics that could be this rupture or reach to uh, quote unquote ontological level can be thought. Tradition that is not mere sign or code but brings collective, quote unquote, unconsciousness or long-term continuity? Can it be called tra tradition real? I don't know, uh, I just put it. it. I don't know how to call it, but uh, it seems like tradition real, so please understand. Uh, we, can, we can consider this another method using Western cultural terms, uh, namely the, I don't know, it's just, I think it's kind of close to the, uh, the what I think about a tradition real, grotesque and neo-Gothic, the sublime, Asian Gothic, or colonial Unheimlich. For the poet Kim, the Kim Soo Young, it is the, the Gothic figure of my mouth, or the crow, the non-speakable non sublime images. It can be tiger too, right? There are a lot of tigers. And uh, epitomizing these uh, features, uh, maybe this painting can be the good example of the uh, the Asian Gothic neo neo Gothic Asian uh, tradition real uh, by Min Jung Gi, uh, the same artist you saw uh, in the previous slide. So. The painting is not cat categorized as the uh, typical landscape one sees from the distance, but rather want to be seen as a kind
kind of, kind of a hallucination. It can be explained as animistic as well as an expansion of the animalistic sen senses interacing with nature. At this level, tradition is not reduced to semiotics or expression. Rather, it is kind of, kind of force. Uh, I wouldn't say physical force, but kind of force, uh, which can be felt or, or can be can be understood. Uh, can be channeled uh, by a, a collective body. It's more like, a, I'm trying to say this is very bodily experience and uh, hard to identify in uh, cultural terms. And uh, one other good example would be the, uh, this tiger uh, appeared in the uh, Apichapong Virasetakun's film, the famous film uh, Tropical Malady. We talk, talk a lot about tiger, but I, nobody talk about Apichapong's tiger, so I want to <laughs> put it here. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to see the film. I mean, the tiger appeared in the, in the wood and the soldier uh, who lost in the wood and, and deep forest, and uh, just all of a sudden he confront with a big tiger. And uh, it was like a really, uh, uh, the soldier got really horrified and uh, calling for murder and uh, different segments of his memory and uh, probably the other's memory and some legend uh, coming to the scene. So this whole uh, being, whole existence is really, was really trembling in this moment uh, of film. I will just uh, jump a little bit is another example by Zero Zigen, uh, based in uh, Osaka. Uh, it's avant-garde um, a group uh, of people uh, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, they were less known uh, in contemporary art scene because of the, the other uh, avant-garde movement in, uh, based in uh, Kyoto, uh, Tokyo. So, but they, they, uh, uh, they play a lot with this, uh, like a, the hard to know of fairy tales and legend of uh, ancient time uh, Japanese uh, stories in their kind of avant-garde look, look like avant-garde uh, performances. Okay, uh, I jump. I will return to the, uh, the poem. Uh, the colossal roots in this um, context. Okay. Uh, is the tradition that transcends simple depiction or iconography. In this phrase, traditions, no matter how filthy, are good. The tradition is, he said it's dirty, it's filthy, and the poet still likes it, which he indeed invokes physical memories beyond, uh, beyond the language, ideology, and probably even culture. Thus, uh, the, the poet said, neither progressivism, socialism, unification, all these things, uh, uh, I mean, they are significant. They are not significant. Therefore, this bears no relation to any lines such as national archetype or sense of Eastern cultures. Rather, tradition beyond uh, culture relates to ghosts, the unspeakable long-term past that still haunts us. So tradition, when I say, you know, say the tradition is not the code of or, or language or even culture, is that tradition is not something that I want to define the tradition as, not something that we can call it, but it comes to us. So the, uh, 
Mm. So to return to the poem again, while reading uh, Him Young reading Bird Bishop, it comes to like, you know, chamber parts, all these small things like uh, long pipes, nursery stories, one-eyed people, uh, barren women, and uh, shoe shops, and so on. These are uh, his huge roots, greater than the, as he put, the, the underwater steel beams of the third Han River Bridge. At the time, the third Han River Bridge was the biggest construction, I guess. Uh, if a uh, critic of Orientalism avoids the object of its criticism, it is also unsound. Sorry. Um, criticizing Orientalism is fine, it's good, but a more flexible approach within the structure of Orientalism itself should be entailed in the criticism. Criticism of Orientalism should be better than Orientalism itself, or should, should contain certain surpassing elements within it. The criticism and the exceder may conflict with, with each other in practice. Even the critical reflection of what is not Orientalism may be derived from outer, especially Western perspectives. This is imperative. What we can do in between escaping the Orientalist structure and demystifying it may even include intentional use of Orientalism. Kim Soo Young, through much trial and error, uh, the poet, finally used Bud Bishop's perspective to, to see. He saw uh, traditional Korean headbands made of horsehair through Bud Bishop's eyes. This is kind of poetic kind of um, uh, um, showing this complexity of uh, how to get out of this uh, oriental uh, colonial culture in uh, the uh, kind of in, in maze. Uh, and he wanted to make, uh, as a poet, he wanted to make kind of break. And it's, this break is something that uh, haunts him like a mammoth. Okay, I will uh, quickly show my own work. I'm an artist, sorry. So, <laughs> okay. So this image, uh, actually, uh, mm, I borrow this form from Oyun's painting. Oh, uh, well, you you saw there's like a. Uh, band marching and the ghost marching. Uh, I got this idea from his painting and also from this, this poem, uh, specific poem, uh, Colossal Root. This is like a 30 minutes long, so I will show just part of it.
Yeah, uh, <laughs> this was not the most dramatic part of the film. Uh, okay. Uh, and they, this work is called uh, uh, Citizens Forest, and I showed in the, the last type, Baby and Nale. Uh, and it uh, will we'll be shown in the, uh, the Basel uh, unlimited exhibition uh, in June. So if you are interested, you can see the whole thing. Uh, okay, this uh, is just Korean word for Philandang. Thank you. <laughs>